Open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, and there's just one verse I want to look at, that'll be verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God, that's you, that's you, that's, that's you, and born of God, the seed, the holy seed that's been put in you, okay, overcometh the world. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. The child of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith gives us the victory. We overcome the world. We overcome death. We are, we're overcomers. We're, we're, we have been ma made overcomers by virtue of the new birth, we are learning how to overcome, and we will finally overcome all, including the sin that is presently within us. And the Bible says if we say we have no sin, we lie, and the truth is not in us. We, 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 in me dwelleth no good thing. But that will be overcome. That will be overcome. And the last vestiges of sin uh, will disappear when we leave here. And that's why we're hoping Lord Jesus, come, even now, and before the broadcast ends, come, Lord. Now, there are seven things that I received that salvation that I want to go over with you. This, this is the guarantee of victory. And you've got to focus on these gifts. I call it seven gifts of salvation. And the reason for that is you're going to lose a lot of things when you walk with the Lord. You, 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 there's going to be some hurt involved. And to make up for that, you've got to focus on the things that you've gained now as a child of God. You keep reminding yourself of these gifts. And that's how you finish your, your course with joy, the ministry. Uh, like Paul wrote in Acts 20, verse 24. Uh, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I may finish uh, my course with joy in the ministry that I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That was his commission. And he states clearly, but none of these things move me. Uh, what? The, the losses, the, the things that happened to him. Uh, none of the, that I may finish my course with joy. With joy. A lot of Christians can't say that. They, they finish with frustration <laughs> bitterness, anger sometimes. God knows what is going on in their hearts and minds uh, when it all stops for them, when the Lord calls them. So let me run through this, and if you want to mark it down, I'll, I'll just pause a second between each one and so you have time to mark it down. I call them, this, these checklists help me, help me to grow uh, as a new Christian and to uh, put my feet on the ground as a Christian by reminding myself of the treasure that I had gained uh, by virtue of the fact that the Lord put me in heavenly places. He seated me in heavenly places. And it, it kept going over that, over that. And that's, you talk about, they talk about today, he has no self-esteem. I got all the self-esteem I needed by, by reading the scriptures and believing what God said about me. And about the new birth. I didn't need to get my self-esteem from others, their approval. I mean, it's, it's, what, you hear this nonsense in psychology today. And the teachers and the counselors, they, they drink from this polluted fountain. Oh, we got to encourage him, so-and-so. He needs, he's very uh, low in self-esteem. Well, you know what gets you low in self-esteem? When you find out you're a sinner. You want to produce a lot of low self-esteem? Hang up the Ten Commandments in every classroom in this country. Okay, beginning in grade school and middle school and high school. Hang them up. B big print. And you'll produce a lot of low self-esteem, which you say is harmful. No, it's not harmful. It's good. It'll show you you're a sinner and you need help. And it'll hopefully point you to the one that could save you from your low self-esteem. And it's not going to be some guidance counselor with a PhD. Man, why? What kind of society do we have today? It's nuts. So here it is. Number one, first gift, forgiveness of sins. 
But where are you going to get that? As a Muslim, forget it. Allah. He's ne- <laughs> Allah the merciful. Yeah, just try it. Just try and cross him and see what happens. Catholic Church, a priest in a box wearing his garments and waving his hand back and forth, I absolve you in the name of G- in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you're crossing yourself in that box and you walk out feeling refreshed because <laughs> you think you've been forgiven of your sins? Are you kidding? And what, the Jews on Yom Kippur attending the synagogue services and fasting all day and bang- banging their chest with, with, their, with, with their hands signifying that they're disgusted uh, with themselves, uh, the way they've lived their life that past year and asking for God's forgiveness and mercy and the services are over and the high holidays are over and not one of them knows if they've been forgiven or not because they're told they can't know. Isn't that a winner? No. I've got forgiveness of sins because the Bible tells me. God tells me in his word. If, it tells me in First John, first chapter. If we confess our sins, two things. He is faithful and just, one, to forgive us our sins. There you go. And two, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wonderful. There it is. A one-two punch. Forgiveness and cleansing. You say, well, sometimes I, 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 I don't feel for you. It doesn't matter what you feel. It's what the word says. If, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. When he saved you and you received him by faith, did he not know then how many sinful and evil things you were going to do? right up until the moment you left this world? Did he not know? Yes, he knew as God. Sure he did. So was his forgiveness narrowed down to only those things up until that point, or did did it encompass everything? It encompassed everything. Does that give you a right to go on sinning, saying that it's all under the blood? No. You go on to fight sin. You go on to practice holiness. Why? Because... That pleases the Lord. That's the way the Lord is, and you want to be like him. What son doesn't want to please his father? Come on. Number two, power to live clean. Uh, No religion gives you that. No religion gives you that power. We have not been given the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Power, power. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy, was chapter 3, at the end of that list of all the degenerate social characteristics in the last days of the church. And he says, having a, the last part said, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. What is that? That's the power of the Holy Spirit to get you to live clean, to get you to turn away from sin. That's the power of the Holy Spirit found when you read the scriptures and you have a believing heart and you yearn for God's power and cleanliness. That's what he gives you. Forgiveness of sins, power to live clean. Three, peace of heart and mind. Peace of heart and mind. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. It's Isaiah, I think 44 or 16. I got to look it up. But I, I memorized that a long time ago. Perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And I felt the Holy Spirit many times say, where is your mind at now? Where is your mind at today? And I'd complain sometimes, a lack of peace or too much anxiety or just restlessness. And that verse would come to me. And I'd say, now where is my mind at? Why is it going off like this? And then again, the scripture telling me, taking every thought into captivity unto Christ every thought into captivity unto Jesus Christ and just getting a hold of these things and not letting my mind run me but me my my spirit my soul are running my mind that's the third four daily provision of needs well that's a promise that's a gift from God there's another promise my God shall supply what all your need in glory, in, uh, by, in glory by Christ Jesus. My God shall supply all your need. All your need. 
uh, one thing you need too is sometimes to be uh, to be chastened. Now, which one is not going to? You need that chastening. So when you say, "My God shall supply all you need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus," did you not think maybe chastening would be a part of that? I said that to a Christian. I think I said that many times. Is you might need a good beating. Oh, Brother Militello, that's what. Well, don't think about it. He promised to supply all you need. And surely that's got to be a need. Think about that. My God shall supply all your need, not just some of them, all. <clears throat> now, uh, number five, grace for trials. Grace for trials. You're not going to walk through situations alone. You're going to walk through situations that could be severe, but with the Lord. He's going to give grace through the trials. We know that. And we have the word. We have confidence because of the word. Uh, Romans 8.28. It's critical that every Christian commit this to memory. Uh, for all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For all things. For all things. Bad things, yeah. All things work together for good. God allows them because he knows that they're going to work for, for good, for your good, and for the glory of God. It doesn't seem that way when it happens, but that's good. And, and then what? In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything. That could be pretty hard if you just lost your, uh, your shelter in your home to a tornado that blew through. And I catch that on the local news especially in the springtime, and it's, it's heartbreaking to see people wiped out like that and uh, be left with nothing and, and have to wait on the Red Cross to, uh, to get a shelter and something. It just breaks your heart. And these are people who don't have much to begin with. Sometimes these tornadoes rip through uh, the trailer parks and they, they, they get twisted up like little toys stepped on. And many of these people, you, you know, on the local news, you hear them say, well, thank God he spared my life. And, uh, but what a night of terror, what moments of terror they had to endure. And then what? You tell them, look at the scripture here. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ. You, you give thanks? It just got wiped out. You just chased, chased out of your home. You have your belongings are 500 yards away from where you used to live. You're supposed to get down and thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's easy to say when, when you're looking at it on TV. But imagine living through it. Say you haven't had an experience like that. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God every day for his mercy and what he has spared you from. Thank God he's coming for us soon. Maybe maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, maybe before the year is out. He's going to spare us from the worst horror that, you, that any human mind can imagine, which is coming upon this world. But he's going to take us home first. So that's grace for trials. Number six, eternal life already begun. Uh, maybe that should be at the top of the list, but I had forgiveness of sins. Because that's, that's personal. That's, that's really, wow. That's, that's something that I could just run to like, like a, good, uh, a good chili, <laughs> a good bowl of chili, uh, forgiveness of sins. But no, I've, I've got eternal life already begun. It tells me that in First John. He that hath the Son hath life. I have life. I have eternal life. And I don't have to guess that I do. I know that I do. I never had that as a Catholic. That's something to get excited about, happy about. And that's already begun. I'm not waiting for it to begin. It has begun. It's already going through me here on earth. And why am I here? So that I could shine as a light in a dark place. And as the world gets darker, that hopefully you and everyone else listening will shine brighter and brighter. And thank God for Final Fight. That's one of the bright, bright lights in these last days. That's a gift. And here's the last one, which is future, coming soon, a sinless body. Whoa, a sinless resurrected body. Now, 
That's the cherry and the whipped cream on top of that delicious ice cream soda. <laughs> I was addicted to as a youth, and now I got diabetes too on account of all the sweets that I was addicted to. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Eternal life, yes, and a sinless body to boot for all eternity. A resurrected body. I'm not going to be a ghost, somebody you see through, some wisp of smoke that passes by. I'm going to have a resurrected body that could sit down and eat, enjoy everything I'm eating without any discomfort, that can go through walls, in and out, through concrete walls like the Lord did when he appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. Imagine that, a sinless body coming my way, ever youthful, uh, not one wrinkle of the skin, not any pain and discomfort anywhere. And a uh, full head of hair, you know, I guess not one hair follicle damaged at all. <laughs> if that's not something to be happy about, then you got a problem. So those are the seven gifts. The forgiveness of sins, the power to live clean, uh, peace of heart and mind. Uh, but th these things you got to grab for yourself, okay? You just, you, you got to reach out and take them. Like the Bible says, put on Christ. Uh, four, daily provision of needs. Five, grace for trials. Six, eternal life already begun. And seven, a sinless body. Now, if that isn't winning the jackpot and the multi-billion dollar lottery, I don't know what is. And if you don't consider yourself a rich person, a rich man or woman, now, as you're alive and breathing on this earth, and you're not paying attention to what God has done, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do, you're not paying attention. You're looking around, and you're noticing the things that are wrong around you and the things that might be wrong in yourself, and they're sighing, and, oh, boy, this is not going right. Yeah, like Jacob said, all these things are against me. That's what Jacob said. He, he wasn't looking at the promised land at all at that point in his life, but I am, and we sing that song. We're marching to Zion. We're not staying here. We're passing through. And like a, a final fight says, and now is your salvation nearer than when we first believed. Amen? Amen. Please open your Bibles to First Chronicles chapter 13. I want to talk about uh, good intentions. Good intentions are nice to have, but they get you nowhere as far as accomplishing what God wants you to accomplish unless you do it God's way. Good intentions are fine, but they do not get the job done. The Bible tells us we worship, God is a spirit, and then that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, the truth being God's word. Father, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. In other words, to honor God, to please God, to worship God, the heart must be right, the intentions good and pure, but it must also be done according to God's word. And what you have here in 1 Chronicles 13 is a grave error committed by David, the king of Israel. Now, as a king, he was uh, obligated to know Torah. He was obligated to read, study, and meditate in Torah and know the law of God. Well, something went wrong here. Uh, maybe memory failed him. But what he does in this chapter turns out to be a disaster. Now, his intentions are wonderful. He wants to move the ark to Jerusalem. His intentions are great, just like he intended to build a house for the ark of God, a temple. He, it's good that these things were in his heart, and God commended him for having these thoughts in his heart. That's good, but it has to be done God's way. Now, let's look at that chapter, starting with the first verse. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. He's calling for an assembly here, pretty big assembly. And verse 3, And let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregation said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. That's interesting. Yeah, we've got the green light. Everybody's behind this. Watch out. 
Watch out. That doesn't make something right. Well, I feel it's right. Wonderful. Your feelings can mislead you. So David, verse 5, gathered all Israel together from Shehor of Egypt, even unto the entering of Hemoth, to bring the ark of God from kiriath Jerim. And David went up in all Israel to Bela, that is, to kiriath Jerim, which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God the Lord, that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. Verse 7, And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahio drave the cart. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might and with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets. This was one great musical procession here. This was quite an event. I'm, I'm sure people were really excited about this. And it was done. I mean, J David wanted the joy. He wanted everyone to experience the joy. This was a wonderful thing. It ends badly. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Shidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him. The guy dropped dead right on the spot. And be because he put his hand to the ark, there he died before God. Why? Well, you'll have to look up Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 8. That'll tell you why. And David, I'll repeat that, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 8. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Well, why was he displeased? If he had read what was in Deuteronomy 10, 8, I'm sure he read it because he says he meditated in the word of God day and night. Something went wrong here. Something went terribly wrong. David caused this problem as king. He should have known better. But before you jump all over that, let me tell you, there were Levites here too. Levites, it says in verse 2. Teachers of the law. Well, what happened with them? What were they doing when David had this ark put in a new cart and had two people around the ark that weren't Levites? What, what was that all about? Why didn't someone come forward and say, wait a second, this isn't according to the way God wants it done. I wish somebody would get up in one of these churches that are crazy on a Sunday morning and tongues of prophecy or all this garbage going on. Somebody get up and say, what is this stuff? This is not done according to the word of God. So David, it says, and David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. Now look at verse 12. And David was afraid of God that day. Well, yeah, you should be. This is a wonderful event that ends in disaster. Saying, David saying, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? Well, David, first you go home by yourself and you get along with God and you get on your knees and find out what this is all about. That's what you do. And then you'll ask God about bringing the ark to Jerusalem. So he says in verse 13, So David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Well, that turned out to be pretty good for the house of Obed-Edom, but it wasn't good for those that we're counting on having a big day. Now turn over to chapter 15 in First Chronicles. I want you to look at verse 2. David finds out what went wrong. He says here in verse 2, it says, Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. Well, there it is. David finds out, and he finds out he made a big, terrible mistake. Now look at verse 13. For because ye did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us. Now watch. For that we sought him not after the due order. For that we sought him not after the due order. Amazing. What is the due order? Well, first look at John 4.24. 24. 
God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's the word of God. How do you worship God? With the right heart and according to his word. Well, they had the right heart, but they did not do it according to the word, which was in Deuteronomy 10.8. And David ought to have known better. You see, brothers and sisters, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, we, all of us, I think there's just going to be so many surprises as the things that were done for the Lord with the right spirit, but not according to God's word. Okay? And listen, I have a, a brother in Christ. I, I don't want to identify him. He lives in a big town. Actually, it's uh, New York City. Goes to a church that I wouldn't go to. It's one of these evangelical churches, and it's nonsense there. And they don't even they, they don't believe the King James Bible. They got one of these modern versions, and uh, they they don't they pervert the word, they correct the word, it's messed up. Now, my brother's a good man. He really, he loves the Lord. Uh, he shouldn't be there. He knows better. He, he knows the King James Bible is the word of God. But in order to please the wife and family, he's where he shouldn't be, okay? Uh, it's fear, fear. His fear of the Lord is not greater than his fear of his wife and pleasing the family. So he's going to be in for a, a shock when he meets the Lord. Why? Because well, he tells me, you know, I tithe, and I know that he does. Very generous man, and, and he believes in that. And the tithe goes to the local church. I said to him one day, you know what's going to happen to you at the judgment seat of Christ when that all that money that was given goes up in smoke? He says, what? I said, it's going to go up in smoke. You financed people who corrected God's book. You financed people that did not fear God took it upon themselves to correct the word of God and say that God was wrong in writing it this way. And it should be this, that, and the other thing. He looked at me. I says, am I getting through? Are you understanding this? Because you have the right heart, and you're a generous man, and, and all those things are good and wonderful, you think you're going to get what for this? A strong rebuke. It's going to go up in smoke. All of that money that was given over the years. What did it do? Fortify some missionary in unbelief that God's word was perfect without error? Give some pastor opportunity to, to, to live good while correcting the word of God? What are you doing? What, did you, what have you done? I said, oh, by the way, my, my coming at you this way is nothing compared to what you're going to hear from the Lord. You're going, to, you're going to have a lion roaring at you and saying, why didn't you know better? Didn't you read my book? Did you believe I could preserve my words? I did. I preserved them. Then were you comfortable sitting under a man who didn't believe that and didn't teach that and yet wanted your support and you gave it to him gladly? My friend... You better have a story. I, I don't know what you're going to say. I says, and I hope this leads. I, I was foolish into thinking this would lead to him making an adjustment as to what church he was going to go to. Uh, because he stayed. You see, and boy, it tells you, uh, fear of the wife or fear of whatever uh, leads you to do things. And you say, well, uh, God knows my heart. No, you're not going to get away with God knows my heart because now I have just told you. I have just told you what to expect. And I'm not talking off the top of my head. God wants it done according to his way. Now this is going to bother you. And every time you make out that check and put it in that envelope and the basket goes by, I want you to remember our conversation. And I want you to lose sleep at night over it. But to comfort yourself, you can grab your wife's hand and say, Honey, aren't we in love? Isn't that wonderful? How many Christians are there like that? Maybe I'm talking to some right now. You want to sell the Lord out that way? Well, face the judgment seat of Christ with a hope and a prayer that you're going to get away without having your skin ripped off your face. Well, good intentions. David had good intentions. Didn't mean a thing. 
You got to get in the book. You got, you got to know the way God wants it done. That's the whole idea. Study, study the word of God. Notice every new Bible leaves out the word study. Every single Bible. It says study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All the new Bible versions leave it out. Why? Well, God forbid you should study. You might actually find out the right way, the way God wants you to do, do things for him. So it's all left out. So who's behind these new Bibles? Can't be the Holy Spirit. He wouldn't leave the word study out. He puts it in the King James Bible. It's left out of all these new Bibles. And these new Bibles are promoted by great Christian leaders and celebrities and radio and TV preachers and all of that. Throw them all in the same barrel and roll it off Niagara Falls as far as I'm concerned. Bunch of losers. But oh boy, how the Christians are willing to give their money because they feel good about where they go to church. It makes them happy. It makes the family happy. It brings a certain peace to their lives that they think is more valuable or they want to believe that God has that for them, peace in the family, as if that was the uh, objective of living a Christian life. No, peace with God. I'll, t I'll, I'll take trouble as long as I have peace with God. I'll take trouble, and I got trouble. Personal trouble, f relatives, friends, loved ones, yes. Trouble and more trouble and sometimes uh, being blamed or slandered for things that aren't so. But to have peace with God and want to please him his way, I'll do it that way. Why? Because I, I, I'm leaving here one day. I'm a pilgrim here. This isn't my home. I've got to give an account. So do you. So do you. And you're not going to give an account to loved ones. My friend is not going to stand before his wife in judgment or answer to his children. I don't understand it. Well, take heed. Take heed. Blessings. Amen. Job chapter 18. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, How long will it be ere ye make an end of words? Mark, and afterwards we will speak. Wherefore be counted as beasts and reputed vile in your sight? He teareth himself in his anger. Shall the earth be forsaken for thee, and shall the rock be removed out of his place? Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. The light shall be dark in his tabernacle, and his candle shall be put out with him. The steps of his strength shall be straightened, and his own counsel shall cast him down. For he is cast into a net by his own feet, and he walketh upon a gin and a snare. The snare shall take him by the heel, and the robber shall prevail against him. The snare is laid for him in the ground, and a trap for him in the way. Terror shall make him afraid on every side, and shall drive him to his feet. His strength shall be hunger bitten, and destruction shall be ready at his side. It shall devour the strength of his skin. Even the firstborn of death shall devour his strength. His confidence shall be rooted out of his tabernacle, and it shall bring him to the king of terrors. It shall dwell in his tabernacle because it is none of his. Brimstone shall be scattered upon his habitation. His root shall be dried up beneath, and above shall his branch be cut off. His remembrance shall perish from the earth, and he shall have no name in the street. He shall be driven from light into darkness and chased out of the world. He shall neither have son nor nephew among his people, nor any remaining in his dwellings. They that come after him shall be astonished at his day, as they that went before were affrighted. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him that knoweth not God. Job chapter 19. Then Job answered and said, how long will ye vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? These ten times have ye reproached me. Ye are not ashamed that ye make yourselves strange to me. And be it indeed that I have erred, mine error remaineth with myself. If indeed ye will magnify yourselves against me and plead against me my reproach, know now that God hath overthrown me and hath compassed me with his net. Behold, I cry out of wrong, but I am not heard. I cry aloud, but there is no judgment. He hath fenced up my way that I cannot pass, and he hath set darkness in my paths. He hath stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. He hath destroyed me on every side, and I am gone. Mine hope hath he removed like a tree. 
He hath also kindled his wrath against me, and he counteth me unto him as one of his enemies. His troops come together, and raise up their way against me, and encamp round about my tabernacle. He hath put my brethren far from me, and mine acquaintance so verily estranged from me. My kinsfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. They that dwell in mine house, and my maids, count me for a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I called my servant, and he gave me no answer. I entreated him with my mouth. My breath is strange to my wife, though I entreated for the children's sake of mine own body. Yea, young children despise me. I arose, and they spake against me. All my inward friends abhorred me, and they whom I loved are turned against me. My bone cleaveth to my skin, to my flesh, and I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. Have pity upon me, have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. Why do you persecute me as God, and are not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reign be consumed within me. But ye should say, Why persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me? Be ye afraid of the sword, for wrath bringeth the punishments of the sword, that ye may know there is a judgment. Job 20. Then answered so far the name of thine, and said, Therefore do my thoughts cause me to answer, and for this I make haste. I have heard the check of my reproach, and the spirit of my understanding causeth me to answer. Knowest thou not this of old, since man was placed upon earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment? Though his excellency mount up to the heavens, and his head reach unto the clouds, yet he shall perish forever like his own dung. They which have seen him shall say, Where is he? He shall fly away as a dream, and shall not be found. Yea, he shall be chased away as a vision of the night. The eye, also, the eye also which saw him shall see him no more, neither shall his place any more behold him. His children shall seek to please the poor, and his hands shall restore their goods. His bones are full of the sin of his youth, which shall lie down with him in the dust. Though wickedness be sweet in his mouth, Though he hide it under his tongue, though he spare it and forsake it not, but keep it still within his mouth, yet his meat in his bowels is turned, it is the gall of asps within him. He hath swallowed down riches, but he shall vomit them up again. God shall cast them out of his belly. He shall suck the poison of asps. The viper's tongue shall slay him. He shall not see the rivers, the bloods, the books of honey and butter. That which he labored for shall he restore, and shall not swallow it down. According to his substance shall the restitution be, and he shall not rejoice therein. Because he hath oppressed and hath forsaken the poor. Because he hath violently taken away an house which he builded not. Surely he shall not feel quietness in his belly. He shall not save of that which he desired. There shall none of his meat be left. Therefore shall no man look for his goods. In the fullness of his sufficiency he shall be in the straits. Every hand of the wicked shall come upon him. When he is about to fill his belly, God shall cast the fury of his wrath upon him, and shall rain it upon him while he is eating. He shall flee from the iron weapon, and the bow of steel shall strike him through. It is drawn, and cometh out of the body. Yea, the glittering sword cometh out of his gall. Terrors are upon him. All darkness shall be hid in his secret places. A fire not blown shall consume him. It shall go ill with him that is left in his tabernacle. The heaven shall reveal his iniquity, and the earth shall rise up against him. The increase of his house shall depart, and his goods shall flow away in the day of his wrath. This is the portion of a wicked man from God, and the heritage appointed unto him by God. Job 21. But Job answered and said, Hear diligently my speech, and let this be your consolation. Suffer me that I may speak, and after that I have spoken, mock on. As for me, is my complaint to man? And if it were so, why should not my spirit be troubled? Mark me, and be astonished, and lay your hand upon your mouth. Even when I remember, I am afraid, and trembling taketh hold on my flesh. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? 
their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not, their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They take the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto him? Lo, their good is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. How oft is the candle of the wicked put out, and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrows in his anger. They are as stubble before the wind, and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. God layeth up his iniquity for his children. He rewardeth him, and he shall know it. His eyes shall see his destruction, and he shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For what pleasure hath he in his house after him, when the number of his month is cut off in the midst? Shall any teach God knowledge, seeing he judgeth those that are high? One dieth in his full strength, being wholly at ease and quiet. His breasts are full of milk, and his bones are moistened with marrow. And another dieth in the bitterness of his soul, and never eateth with pleasure. They shall lie down alike in the dust, and the worms shall cover them. Behold, I know your thoughts, and the devices which ye wrongfully imagine against me. For ye say, Where is the house of the prince, and where are the dwelling places of the wicked? Have ye not asked them that go by the way, and do ye not know their tokens? That the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction? They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. Who shall declare his way to his face? And who shall repay him what he hath done? Yet shall he be brought to the grave, and shall remain in the tomb. The clods of the valley shall be sweet unto him, and every man shall draw after him, as there are innumerable before him. How then comfort ye me in vain, seeing in your answers there remaineth falsehood? Job 32. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, can a man be profitable unto God, as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous? Or is it any gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? Will he reprove thee for fear of thee? Will he enter with thee into judgment? Is not thy wickedness great, and thine iniquities infinite? For thou hast taken a pledge from thy brother for naught, and stripped the naked of their clothing. Thou hast not given water to the weary to drink, Thou hast withholden bread from the hungry. But as for the mighty man, he had the earth, and the honorable man dwelt in it. Thou hast sent widows away empty, and the arms of the fatherless have been broken. Therefore snares are round about thee, and sudden fear troubleth thee, or darkness that thou canst not see, and abundance of waters cover thee. Is not God in the height of heaven? And behold the height of the stars, how high they are. And thou sayest, How doth God know? Can he judge through the dark clouds? Thick clouds are a covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood, which said unto God, Depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for them? Yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from me. The righteous see it and are glad, and the innocent laugh them to scorn. Whereas our substance is not cut down, but the remnant of them the fire consumeth, acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace. Thereby good shall come to thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. For then shalt thou have thy delight in the Almighty, and shall lift up thy face unto God. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Thou shalt also decree a, a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. When men are cast down, then thou shalt say, There is a lifting up, and he shall save the humble person. He shall deliver the island of the innocent, and that is delivered by the pureness of thine hands. Job 23. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. 
Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come before his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he'd say to me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps, his ways have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. But he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. For he performeth the thing that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Therefore my trouble at his presence. When I consider, I am afraid of him. For God maketh my heart soft, and the Almighty troubleth me. Because I was not cut off before the darkness, neither hath he covered the darkness from my face. Job 24. Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? Some remove the landmarks. They violently take away flocks and feed thereof. They drive away the ass of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox for a pledge. They turn the needy out of the way. The poor of the earth hide themselves together. Behold, as wild asses in the desert go they forth to their work, rising betimes for a prey. The wilderness yieldeth food for them and for their children. They reap, they reap every one his corn in the field, and they gather the vintage of the wicked. They cause the naked to lodge without clothing, that they have no covering in the cold. They are wet with the showers of the mountains and embrace the rock for want of shelter. They pluck the fatherless from the breast and take a pledge of the poor. They cause him to go naked without clothing, and they take away the sheep from the hungry, which make oil within their walls and tread their wine presses and suffer thirst. Men groan from out of the city, and the soul of the wounded crieth out, yet God layeth not folly to them. They are those that rebel against the light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the paths thereof. The murderer, rising with the light, killeth the poor and needy, and in the night is as a thief. Thy eye also of the adulterer waiteth for the twilight, saying, No eye shall see me, and disguiseth his face. In the dark they dig through houses, which they had marked for themselves in the daytime. They know not the light, for the morning is to them even as the shadow of death. If one know them, they are in terrors of the shadow of death. He is swift as the waters. Their portion is cursed in the earth. He beholdeth not the way of the vineyards. Drought and heat consume the snow waters, so doth the grave those which have sinned. The womb shall forget him. The worm shall feed sweetly on him. He shall no more be remembered, and wickedness shall be broken as a tree. Evil entreateth the barren that beareth not, and doeth not good to the widow. He draweth also the mighty with his power. He riseth up, and no man is sure of life. 